Welcome to the porch. I'm Richard Grund. This is where we get back to basics, the red letter basics, by examining the Word of God and especially the book of Acts Church to see how the early church served the Lord. The Porch Online Bible Study has always taken a deeper look into their service to the kingdom of God so that we can follow their example. Our desire has always been to find and restore the priesthood of the believer and regain the world-shaking influence the early church had. By digging deep into Scripture, we find the church the Lord intended, not the one that man created. The church age is not over, and what happened in the upper room is as much for today as it was on the day of Pentecost. If you know that there's more for your spiritual walk, to your spiritual walk with Yeshua, with Jesus, and you want more, then you're welcome to join us on this journey. If you have any questions, please visit firefalltalkradio.com. Use the contact button. Write us directly at the porch, lowercase one word, at firefalltalkradio.com. If you'd like to support what we do, go to the main page on firefalltalkradio.com for ways to do so. Um, there's only right now two ways to three ways. One is PayPal, then Venmo, and, um, you know, mailing a check or whatever you want to do. If you need more information, go there, use the contact button, reach reach out to us. The two more um, sites we're planning on using, but it's taken a little while to get it all worked out because I know some of you don't want to do business with PayPal. Um, but we appreciate you. Those of you that support us, we appreciate your support and the encouragement that comes from it. And we would like to ask if you haven't supported what we do to consider doing so. Welcome to all the listeners from the various streaming platforms. Thank you for your prayers. Feeling better. Uh, allergy season's really bad this year. It's been on the news. Pollen's the worst it's ever been for a long time in the South. And the clinics are full and sinuses are full. And, and uh, it's still there, but we carry on. If you need prayer, you want to pray for others, contact us. Let us know. Remember, we care about you. And I don't, those aren't just words I'm saying. I'm sincere about the fact that I pray for you. If I know you by name, if you've sent me an email, you are prayed for. If I don't know you by name, but you listen, I pray for you. Make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen as well as on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so that you're up to date. Um, and that way, if we use a couple of different streaming platforms right now, we pay to do so. If for some reason we stop doing that, like we did recently with one of them, you want to be subscribed to find out where else to listen. But you can always get us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. So, Father, we just come to you now in the name of Yeshua. We thank you. We thank you for giving him to us. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent him to die for us. We thank you for the ability to come together as your children, to worship you, to talk about you, to learn more about you, to love on you, because we do. We love you. Abba, Father, Papa, God, Daddy, we love you. We thank you for sending Yeshua. And Lord, we thank you for paying the price, for doing what we could never do and would never have been able to do, and that's be reconciled to the Father so that we can have the relationship with him that Adam had. And someday we'll have it physically, and that'll be pretty awesome. But until then, we do it through you and your Holy Spirit. So thank you. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our loved ones. I thank you for everything you've given me, starting with my salvation. Without that, I have nothing, and I am nothing. I thank you for choosing me, putting me into the family business, for giving me back the family I threw away, for setting me free from the demonic powers I had allowed to take over my life and take over me, to be born again name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How awesome is that? Thank you for our our loved ones, our furry kids, the technology, 
And Lord, we thank you for the protection you offer us, that Psalm 91 covering in a fallen world. We need it. Your, your church needs it. You, we need you to intercede for us right now in this nation and in this world and empower us to go and do what needs to be done to push back the enemy and to slow him down and destroy his works. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to do whatever you want to do. Have your way tonight. Begin to touch people. Begin to heal people. Begin to answer their prayers and their questions and draw them closer to you. Bless and protect the technology, and we ask all these things in Yeshua's name. If you agree with me, say amen. These lessons are proprietary information, except where noted the information comes from outside sources. The combination of that information, the matter presented, is exclusive, cannot be repeated or used without permission. The date of this broadcast serves as the registered date of the following information. You know, when we come together every week, I do this, beside the fact that I love to do it, it to prepare you and allow you to walk in this world in the authority and the freedom that the Lord desired for you to have. And in doing so, sometimes it's a Bible study in that we take apart Scripture. Sometimes I, I wind up preaching. Sometimes I just sit here and talk to you. And then many times it's all of the above. And I hope that's what you're here for, the transparency, the the. the desire to draw you closer to him and tonight's bible study which is called the sure foundation has come out of i don't want to say a frustration but in dealing with people and and you know lord took me to the scripture in regard to a situation i was involved in recently and i thought you know what there's something more here and and i began to flesh it out and the spirit began to speak to me and so I hope this blesses you. I hope this is for you tonight. So open your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to go. We're going to start with verse 10. This is Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And he says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can any one lay that which is laid, which is Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If any one's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If any one's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And if anyone defiles the temple of God, Paul says, God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So he's making multiple points here that we're going to talk about hopefully over the next 50 minutes. He's telling the church in Corinth, do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit is, has his permanent dwelling in you, to be at home in you, collectively as a church and also individually. If anyone does hurt to God's temple or corrupts it with false doctrines or destroys it, God will do hurt to him and bring him 
to the corruption of death and destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, sacred to him. And that temple, you, the believing church, and its individual believers are. The Spirit of God lives in us. In both corporately and individually, we are the temple of God. And it's so important to him that if anyone seeks to destroy it through deceptive teachings or manipulation or any of the things we've seen since the beginning of the church, they will be punished for it. That's how important to him you are. Paul says he's a master builder. The Greek word is architecton, where we get the word architect. The building plans belong to God, but the execution of the plan was entrusted to Paul. God wrote the blueprint. Paul follows them. But we need to take heed how it's built upon that foundation. That's why Paul says, let every man be careful to preach the same doctrines that I have preached. And then he asks that no one preach contrary to them. Now, why is Paul saying this? Well, sectarianism had arisen in the church. The First Corinthians church, the book of First Corinthians was written in about A.D. 55. So within 20 years or so of the death of the Lord, there's already a problem. Paul f- begins the church. He lays the foundation for the church in Corinth. And a few years after leaving there, he begins to hear disturbing reports about the Corinthian church, that they are full of pride and excusing sexual immorality, that spiritual gifts were being used improperly. There was a a rampant misunderstanding of key biblical doctrines. Kind of sounds like today. And he writes his first letter, letter to them in an attempt to restore the church to its foundation, which is the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. So we got to back up to the first couple of, you know, scriptures, the uh, First Corinthians 3, verse 4. And this is the issue that triggers his correction, if you will. When one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not proving yourselves ordinary, unchanged men? What then is Apollos? What, what is Paul? Ministering service, servants, not heads of parties, through whom you believed, even as the Lord appointed to each his task. I planted, Apollos watered, but God all the while was making it grow, and he gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but only God who makes it grow and become greater. He who plants and he who waters are equal. They are one in aim of the same importance and esteem. Yet each shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are also fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God, and you are God's garden, vineyard, a field under cultivation. You are God's building. See, the planting is of the Lord that he may be glorified. That ties back to Isaiah 61. But in the Corinthian church, we now have divisions. They're dividing up into groups loyal to certain spiritual leaders. And I've seen this the whole time I've been a believer and got caught up in it myself. And I'm I'm not sure what it is about us as people. But we want to worship somebody. We want to follow somebody. We want to admire. We want to put them up on a pedestal on a stage. That superstar Christianity, which I have railed against the entire time we've had the porch. Actually, the letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians starts out with this in chapter 1, verse 10. But I urge you, believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that all of you be in full agreement in what you say. 
and that there be no divisions or factions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about the matters of faith. For I've been informed about you, my brothers and sisters, by those of Chloe's household, that there are quarrels and factions among you. I mean this, that each one of you says, I'm a disciple of Paul, or I'm a disciple of Apollos, I'm a disciple of Peter, I'm a disciple of Messiah. Has Messiah been divided into different parts? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Certainly not. I thank God that I did not baptize you, any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one could say that you were baptized into my name. Now, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. For Messiah did not send me as an apostle to baptize, but commissioned and empowered me to preach the good news of salvation, not with clever and eloquent speech as an orator, so that the cross of Messiah would not be made effective, derived of its saving power. See, this is what happens, and I've seen it happen. No matter how hard you try to not allow it to happen, it does. Somebody's a good speaker, they have a good presence, they have charisma. They get up there, oh, I want to hear him. I don't want to hear anybody else. If he's not preaching, I'm not coming. When we had the home fellowship, my goal was to get other people to get up and speak. And the, the other men in the group and were, were just not eloquent. They were not good at it. My mistake was giving in to the complaints and becoming the focal point. I will not do that again. If God gives me another place to worship and fellowship with people, that will not happen. There'll be no more stages, no more elevation of speakers or singers or anybody. It'll be in the round. We'll all be on the same level and nobody be looking at the back of somebody's head like they're in a theater format. But Paul is quickly destroying the validity of such distinctions by saying, We should all be one in Messiah. These quarrels, these divisions had come from uh, the, you know, friends that he had there, Chloe's household. And again, I've seen it. I've been a part of it. As I was sitting working on this today, the Lord was reminding me of when I made these mistakes. I got caught up in the personality driven concept that has now become so distasteful to me. People follow, hey, so-and-so said this, and -and so-and-so said that. And I'm thinking, okay, and your point is, what does the Spirit say? What's the Lord saying to you? Well, you know what so-and-so said about that? No, I want to know what the Lord's saying to you. But how frequently do congregations divide up into cliques? So these four groups around four prominent leaders, the fourth being the Lord, exclusive. I I follow the Lord exclusively. I'm Jesus only. Um, Maybe they followed Paul because of his emphasis on ministering to the Gentiles. Or maybe they followed Apollos because he was a learned and eloquent, eloquent preacher from Alexandria. Or maybe they followed Paul, uh, Peter rather, because they were impressed by his emphasis on the Jews. Isn't, isn't this all ridiculous? One man hung on the cross. One man shed his blood. Only one man should we be following. We still struggle with this. And we still struggle with allowing immorality. We still struggle with the misuse of spiritual gifts. And the reason for that is there's an enemy out there that takes advantage of our fleshly nature. This could have been written to churches today, buildings, congregations, of Paul warning them. And what he's trying to do and what I'm doing here, and I'll explain why. Let's get our focus back on the Lord. I think the YouTube videos are great. I post them. I think the podcasts are great. We know I do them. 
But all that's meant to do is point you to the Lord, point you to the Word, point you to the Spirit. If it points you to an individual, that's why I don't put my name on anything. And I never will. And I'm sure that has cost me support and popularity and money. Won't do it. I'm not here to promote me. I'm here to promote him. And if that's the way it turns out, then that's the way it turns out. My reward will come later. The focus should be on the Lord alone. And the personality-driven church was already forming, and it is an overdrive today. I saw somebody sent me a video of someone who had been to Asbury Revival talking about what the Spirit was doing. The Spirit was in control. There was no one speaker, no one focus. It was all organic. It was all spontaneous. And then this individual took over the service. Hey, let's get everybody lined up, and I'm going to pray and lay hands on you and impart upon you what I got. And I'm did you did you miss the point of the revival? Did you miss what the Lord was saying? Is this is what I want? I want the focus on me. I want it on worship. I want it on testimonies. I want you praying for one another. That's what we need. And the seed of division from the enemy is constantly being planted and it's constantly being watered. So the appeal for unity based upon the name of the Lord is the person who we should be focused on. He's the one who got lifted up on a cross, beaten and bloodied. We even do it in, in films and television. Somebody plays a role. They play Jesus. They play Peter. And they do a really good job. The next thing you know, they're, they're on every show and they're in everything. And, oh, and they're focused on the individual. What is with that? We have to do what Paul did. We have to do what the disciples did. When that happens, you have to reject it. The angels do it. If you try to worship them, they will chastise you. All glory goes to the one who died for you. Paul will exalt the name of the Lord, Yeshua, Adonai Yeshua. And what he's saying is that worship will bring unity to the people of God. We will begin to speak the same thing and have the same mind and be of one accord. And that being of one accord means loyalty and allegiance. And it struck me when I saw that. Acts one fourteen, And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Yeshua and his brothers. That's in the, the upper room. Then we see Acts two one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. They were all of one mind. They were all of one loyalty and allegiance in one place. Acts 2.46, about the the exploding church, so continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Acts 5.12, the scripture that we're based on, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They were all of one mind. They were all of one purpose. They were all of one worship. And the continuing power in the book of Acts Church came from the unity of mind, heart, and spirit. Get your eyes off of people. They're always going to fail you. Flesh will always fail you. Put your eyes on him. Put your heart on him. Put your hopes on him. When factions become formed in the body, it denies the unity, and it's an insult to the one who has been crucified for that body. Yeah, I don't know why once I got this, and it was right when we started the home church in Tallahassee, the... um, I guess for us, the foundation of what we do, it really hit home to me because the Lord showed me 
the error of my ways, showed me how I had become everything I hated, showed me how I had bought into the hero worship and the, the elevation of man. Which is why when I go speak somewhere, if there's a stage, I won't be on it. I'll be on the ground. I won't be sitting up there. I'll be sitting with the people. I didn't do anything special. I didn't die for you. And I'm I'm just a vessel that he can speak through and use however he wants to. There's only one person we should worship. And we should do it in unity. Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. Make every effort to keep the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Each individual working together to make the whole successful. There is one body of believers and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when called to salvation. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is sovereign over all and working through all and living in all. See, Messiah, not Peter, No matter what a very large organization says, Peter is not the foundation of the church. The Lord is. He's the cornerstone. Ephesians chapter 2, starting verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. See, Paul planted the church. He started that church. And while he was gone, Apollos ministered there and he watered it and had a very significant ministry there after Paul left. But both of these men were only servants whom God used. One planted, one watered, and neither one of them has anything to boast about because the God, the Father, your Abba, gave the increase because it's only him who draws believers to himself. Now, it's our responsibility to do our job no matter what the results, for God will reward us for our efforts and the quality of our work. I can't tell you how much that holds me secure. Because I'll be honest with you, for the time that we've been doing this, since I got saved and since the porch started in May, March actually, but May online of uh, 2010, there's 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 no money in this. There's no physical advantage to it outside of the the flow of the spirit and the excitement and everything that I do, but I know my rewards are not here. And I know that those that have found their rewards and manipulated their rewards and fleeced the flock are going to get to paradise and be a little surprised when they find out they spent their inheritance. But the Lord receives all the credit for any growth or success because it's he that does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord lays that out for us in John 15. If we look at it a little differently now of what I just said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bear fruit, bears fruit, he trims so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I will abide in you. The branch cannot itself produce fruit unless it abides on the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch 
and is dried up. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. And this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Who are we grafted into? Who are you grafted into? You're grafted into the true vine, which is Yeshua. That's what produces the fruit. He's the true vine. And unless we're connected to him, exclusively to him, the quality of our fruitfulness is going to be unacceptable. Unless the sap of the Holy Spirit flows from him to us, the fruit that we produce is going to be the wrong fruit. But if we are so attached to him that there's nothing to impede the free flow of the Spirit, the fruit that comes off of the branch, us, is going to be sweet. It's going to be filling. It's going to be the best that it could be because the Father himself is the gardener. He's the vine dresser. He's the one doing it. The success of any crop depends on the skill of the gardener. Think about that. We try to take credit or or preachers or teachers try to take credit. No, no, no. There's only one person who can take credit. He tends it. He waters it. He protects it. He cultivates it. He trims it so it can have a maximum yield. I'm not, not so sure I like the trimming part, but I like the maximum yield part. And continued production depend upon the constant union. Because if you get broken, if you get if, if even you just get bent, you're never going to produce fruit again. I know I shared this story. There's a book that's out of print. I actually tried to get some copies, and they're just not to be found. And so the book's called The Vineyard. The guy wrote a book about the vineyard from his perspective because his father had one, and he talked about the one summer that he and his cousins were working for his father, and they were harvesting the grapes, and he and his cousins each had their own row, and they started to compete to see who could get it done the quickest. And, of course, they rushed, and they got to the end of the row, and there were broken branches that would never produce fruit again. And he looked up, and he saw his father's eyes and the hurt and disappointment that in their zeal and their zest they had destroyed these branches. That's how the Father feels. That's why it's so important to Him how we treat one another. And I may have already shared this, but when He gave me that revelation and saw that in my zeal, in in my fire, in my desire to serve Him, you know, with my personality, that I had broken branches. I had trimmed people. I had been rough with people. And it broke me. Drove me to my knees. Sobbing. Hurt, disappointed. And as the tears flowed and the Mucus flowed because it was it was that kind of serious sobbing. I could feel and see in the spirit the Lord walk up behind me, put his hand on my shoulder, look up at the Father and say, I think he finally got it. That's what ministry is about. It's not about pruning and breaking people. It's about helping them be fruitful. It's about helping the Holy Spirit flow through their life. Fruit bearing is not only possible to us, it's inevitable when we're connected to him. When this, the life of Messiah, when he saturates us, when he soaks into us, that kind of fruit is inevitable, and that ties to Luke twenty four forty nine. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, which is the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are 
endued until you are soaked in with power from on high. Too many people are working under their own power. They're working under technique. They're working under man-made schemes and plans and programs. And what Ashbury was about, it was all about the Holy Spirit. It wasn't about programs. It wasn't about educators. It wasn't about seminaries or, or, or certificates or any of those things. It was about worshiping the Lord and worshiping the Father and letting the Holy Spirit have his way. If you're struggling in your walk, if you're struggling in your life, it's because you're holding on. Trust him enough to open your hand, relax your grip, and say, Holy Spirit, have your way with me. Do what you need to do, and then just let him do it. Because when we fail to maintain a vital connection with the Lord through the Holy Spirit, there is a penalty. When we become useless, fruitfulness is normal for believers. A fruitless life is visual evidence that one is not a believer. I'm sorry that sounds cold, but I, I said it. There's no place in, in the Word, there's no place among his followers to not bear fruit. And it won't be rewarded. The proof of discipleship The proof of true teachers is fruit-bearing. And true teachers cause fruit to be born. That's what Matthew 7, 15 through 23 is all about. Watch out for false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, for you will recognize them by their fruit. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree produces good fruit, but the rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a rotten tree produce good fruit. So then, you will know them by their fruit. Right after he says that, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will come to me on that day, the day of the Lord, the final judgment. Lord, Lord, did we, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name and, and perform many miracles in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. He ties being fruitful and producing fruit for him and then explains what happens to those who don't. Brothers and sisters, there's only one foundation for our belief. It's not a denomination. It's not an organizational religious entity. It's not a famous preacher, teacher, televangelist. No, there's only one foundation for our beliefs, and that's the Lord himself. No one else, no other name in heaven and earth by which we might be saved. That's what Peter said to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, and he got their attention, pierced their hearts, and they got saved. But the church in Corinth were not behaving right. They were not behaving like spiritual people, people who had the Holy Spirit in them, but they were acting like unbelievers. They were living by the values of the world. They were acting like babies in Messiah, infants. Even though they'd been converted, they'd never matured, and the Holy Spirit had never been allowed to change them. 1 Corinthians 3, 2, if I fed you with milk and not with solid food, I fed you with milk. Let me stop, because my brain went went someplace else, because I thought about an encounter this week that inspired this, where I wanted to tell somebody who's been a believer for a very long time, grow up. It's time to grow up. It's time to stop acting like a baby in the Lord, an infant, and start acting with maturity. Start eating meat instead of nibbling on the stuff that you nibble on. That's what Paul's saying to 
to the church in Corinth, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you're still not able. There should be some maturity. If you're, if you're a baby believer, if you just got saved or you just tuned into the porch and all this is new, new to you, you're in that period of grace. You're going to trip. You're going to fall. You're going to make mistakes. But if you've been at this for a while and you're still doing the same stuff, it's time to grow up. It's time to stop excusing the behavior. It's time to start being honest and transparent with the Holy Spirit. These believers in Corinth lacked spiritual maturity. So Paul couldn't teach them the deeper truths about the life in Messiah. He couldn't feed them solid food. He had to restrict them to milk the basic teachings of the good news, and the enemy took advantage of that, as he does today. Hebrews 5, verse 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Again, First Peter. This is obviously a common problem in the early church, and we can't seem to get it right. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you've tasted the Lord, that the Lord is gracious. The church of the living God today needs to grow up. We need to stop falling for the same tricks. We need to stop falling for the smokes smoke and mirrors and the sleight of hands and the spiritual magicians and the snake oil salesmen. I don't understand how people are so easily fooled. They'll send me a a, a, a writing or a, a video and I'll look at it and go, this is new age. This is heresy. This is a false teaching. How can you not see this? And they don't. They just don't. So the jealousy and the quarreling and the uh, um, of this person and that person just showed they were immature. They were not under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that proudly identifying yourself with the preferred teacher was very common in Greek culture. But it's not in keeping with the thinking of the Lord. He pointed to the Father, and the Holy Spirit points to the Lord. That's it. No man should be elevated. No woman should be elevated. I've said it before, and I'll say this again. If you've got your name on your ministry, I don't want anything to do with you. Until you can be scourged, beaten, nailed to a cross, drip every drop of blood, die, and rise on the third day, you're not all that. There's only one name. There's only one person. It's his ministry. It's his church. Oh, and I get the whole branding thing. Well, they can't find me. They can't they can't buy my books and my t shirts and my coffee cups. They they can't donate. They can't do this and I can't make that money and I can't get the clicks and make the money on YouTube and all these other places if they if they don't know who I am. Oh, I I believe me, I understand that. And even knowing all that, I I can't do it. I won't do it. If the Holy Spirit can inspire someone to to bless what we do, then I, I, I don't have any control. So Paul establishes the church in Corinth on the foundation of Messiah. Then he uses building materials, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, that indicate the quality of the work done. And the day, the day of the Lord, when everyone will be judged, us first, 
and then the world is not about the eternal fire of damnation. This is the fire that proves the quality of things. Fire proves the quality of gold. But it consumes wood, hay, and straw. So some good work that looks real good is actually self-centered aggrandizement, self-promotion. All good things are God. No, let me phrase that. Bring anyone else for Sorry. All God things are good, but not all good things are God. The true value of our service will become obvious on that day when we stand before him. I want what I do to be God things. And that'll make them good. Have I always succeeded at that? Probably not. But I've always tried. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eye with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's Revelation 4, Revelation 3, 14 through 22. I'm sorry, I'm just so deep in what I'm talking about in the Spirit right now. I'm really struggling to hold it together. I so desire that we would get this. And the world so needs it. Believers know that they need it. People drove 10 hours to go to Asbury to experience what they were hearing about there because they couldn't find it where they were. People are desperate for this intimacy, this simplicity, the focus on the Lord alone, the praising of him alone, not entertainment. Because what we do with our walk is what we are judged by. The foundation of what we will what we believe will be what we or others built. They will build that temple which is us. And this is where this lesson really came from as I thought about the foundation thing, it struck me. The most important person in building a home is the one who builds the foundation. If it's not level, if the concrete's wrong, if it's not done right, if it's not put on the right surface, it doesn't matter what you build or how good it looks. It's the foundation. That's the most important person. The water, the electrical, the piping, everything, they, it comes from the foundation. The walls get set on the foundation. It's not the ornate house, but yet who do we acknowledge and celebrate? The designers, the, the interior designers, the person who designs these beautiful structures that we look at and go, I'd like to live there. Well, you know what? I'd like to know who the foundation guy is. What's his reputation? 
What's underneath it? Is the dirt right? Is it compacted right? Is it going to shift and flood or is water going to get in there? I want to know who did that. Because if a foundation cracks and shifts, you can't fix it. You have to tear the house down and start over. We are personally responsible and accountable to God for the way we live and serve the Lord. We are responsible for who we follow and what we believe. We will be judged on our choices. They'll be judged on theirs. But the house that we build, the house that we allow to be built, the temple that we are, we will answer to him, for as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself or herself to God. Romans fourteen eleven through 12. And this is a phrase, I'm going to share a phrase with you that I, I use with people that are unbelievers. when I try to witness to them. And I do it in such a way, and I basically the outcome is not my responsibility. And I tell them this. When the end comes, you'll stand alone before the judgment seat of Almighty God. I won't be there. Nobody else will be there. It'll be just you and God. So what you do is on you. The choices you make are on you. And the people that build on the foundation of Messiah will endure. And when they're tested by fire, the others will be burned up. But yours will be secure. Yours won't. On Judgment Day, the work of each builder who instructs the church will be assessed. That's why James 3.1, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. We teachers will be judged by a higher standard and with greater severity than other people. Therefore, we assume the greater accountability and the more condemnation. So that's believers have to be very careful both in what they teach and how they relate to one another. Because as a body... We are the temple of God. We are the home of the Spirit of God. And God's temple is holy. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Ephesians 2, 21 through 22, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into what? A holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. When he made Adam by hand and filled him with his Holy Spirit and brought him to life, he became designer goods. And that gets replicated every time someone's born. But now... You must be born again to have the Spirit fill. So getting back to where all this started, there are consequences for anyone who destroys God's temple by such things as jealousy or argumentativeness, divisiveness, and and through false teaching and deception. Let's circle back to something as I close here. Beware of false prophets, teachers who come to you dressed as sheep, appearing gentle and innocent, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them, that is, by their contrived doctrine and self-focus. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every healthy tree bears good fruit, and the healthy, unhealthy tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will recognize them as false prophets. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day when I judge them. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, driven out demons in your name, done many miracles in your name? And then I will declare to them publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you are banished from my presence, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. And this is how the Lord closes out this statement. So, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man, far-seated, practical, sensible, who built far-sighted, I'm sorry, far-sighted, practical, sensible, who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed into that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish, stupid man who built his house on the sand. There are only two foundations, solid rock or sinking sand. Well, as for me, on Messiah, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Lord, right now, everybody, myself included, can we do a check? Can we do a check on the foundation? Holy Spirit, can you examine us, speak to us, show us areas where we may have accepted false teachings, we may have been deceived, We may have allowed ourselves to get into the worship of people so that we can repent and put it under the blood. For you alone, Lord, are worthy. You alone deserve all glory and honor and praise, majesty and might. Only you. Only you, Lord. We want to worship you. And we want to walk And do what you want us to do. We want to produce this fruit that you're talking about. Set the captives free. Lead people to you. Disciple them. Explain things to them so that they can do it to others. And bear more fruit. Holy Spirit, we listen. We open our ears and we listen. Show us. Now even as we sleep, maybe through dreams and visions, maybe through angelic visitations. Maybe you, Lord, show up and talk to us and show us where there might be a crack in the foundation. We need this right now. Your church needs this so that we can take this final wave of the Spirit, this final move, and do it right, not the way it's been done before pure and holy, righteous in your name and your name alone. And I pray all these things in that name, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord, may Adonai make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, give you shalom. I'm Richard Grun. This has been The Porch on Firefall Talk Radio.